In this video, we'll look at valence bond theory. Before we start looking at valence bond theory, let's first review our overlapping and bonding. So if we remember, having 1s orbitals for the hydrogens gave us a covalent bond where both 1s orbitals were overlapping a little bit. If we had a hydrogen and chlorine, there's overlap between a p orbital and a 1s orbital. Or both chlorines can have the 3p orbital overlapping. So remember that our covalent bond is just the overlap of these orbitals and the sharing of electrons between adjacent atoms. And when we look at valence bond theory, valence bond theory helps us explain how the atoms bond together to create molecules. For valence bond theory, hybridization plays a major role and a major part of how the bonding is done. And there are really two ways that the orbitals can overlap. We can either have the head-on overlapping that we've been seeing, and that's where we get our single bonds. So that would be what we would call our single bond, where there's just one pair of electrons being shared. It's also called a sigma bond. And often denoted by using the Greek symbol for sigma. Now there's another way that our orbitals can overlap. Instead of being head on like they are for our sigma bond, they can actually overlap side to side. So if I had two unhybridized p orbitals next to each other, their orbitals would actually start to overlap on top and on bottom of the internuclear axis. So this is where the two nuclei of the atoms are. And there'd be orbital overlap on the top part and the bottom part. So that's what we tend to call a pi bond. And it again is still a pair of electrons that's shared in the pi bond. So whether it's the sigma bond where it's the head-on overlap or pi bond where it's a side overlap, there's still some sort of overlap and there's still sharing of electrons. Remember, sigma is just kind of head-on overlap. Pi bond is the orbitals are next to each other enough that the electron starts to jump back and forth and be shared. Looking a little closer at these sigma bonds, our sigma bonds are characterized by their head-to-head -head overlap. And so it'd be, it can be an overlap of s orbitals, it can be overlap of p orbitals, or it can be an overlap of hybridized orbitals. But there's still a head-to-head -head overlap. Pi bonds, on the other hand, are a side-to-side -side overlap. So that happens when you have two p orbitals next to each other. And if they get close enough in space, the electrons will start going back and forth between these two orbitals. That's how we create the pi bond. So it's the two orbitals just sitting. So it's the two orbitals just sitting right next to each other that helps us create our pi bond. Looking at these different orbitals and the Lewis structures, we can start to determine the hybrid orbitals and what kind of bond each of them is being formed in, what hybrid orbital is being used. So if we're to draw our Lewis structure for ammonia, NH3, you can end up with something like what's drawn right here our nitrogen's in the center, plus a single bond to each hydrogen. And then there's also a lone pair on the nitrogen. So we can see it has three NH bonds and one lone pair. Yeah, those NH bonds, since they're single bond, they're head-on overlapping. So that would be a sigma bond. So it'd be a sigma bond for each of these. And then we can also tell what the hybridization is for nitrogen. Nitrogen, since it has three things attached to it and a lone pair, so there's four things total, that means it has to be sp3. And so my nitrogen is sp3 here. Hydrogen cannot hybridize. Hydrogen has to use its 1s orbital. So nitrogen is using its sp3 orbital to bond. Hydrogen is using its 1s orbital to bond. And if we were to draw the hybrid orbital diagram for nitrogen, it would look something similar to this. Our 1s orbital here, that's our core electrons. And then here's our valence electrons. It hybridized into an sp3. So it's trigonal pyramidal. So since it's sp3, it's trigonal pyramidal. 
we can see there's three electrons that are unpaired. Each of these three electrons are bonded to a hydrogen. And then we have two electrons that are paired up. This is actually our lone pair. So this happens to be our lone pair of electrons that we draw on our nitrogen. And then each of these is bonded and sharing electrons with one of the hydrogens. So we can see looking at the hybrid orbital diagram, we can figure out what, which electrons are the lone pairs, which ones are bonded to other atoms, what the hybridization is, and what type of bond they're making. Since it's just one electron being shared, that's where we get our single bond, that's where we get our sigma bond. So that's the head-to-head -head overlapping. So now let's look at the hybrid orbital diagram for ethylene. Ethylene is, oops, ethylene is CH2, CH2. So that means this carbon is bonded to two hydrogens and to the carbon. This carbon is bonded to two hydrogens and the other carbon. If we were to draw its Lewis structure, we'd end up with something like what's shown here. We have our carbons that are bonded to two hydrogens and then to another carbon. Each carbon, we can see, has three domains around it. So I have three groups around it, which means it has to be a trigonal planar. If it's trigonal planar, then it has to be sp2 hybridized. So if we were to draw the orbital diagram, we have our core electrons sp2 hybridized, and then our one unhybridized p orbital. Now we can see here we have one electron in each one of these orbitals, even one in the unhybridized p orbital. So what's going to happen is our carbon is going to bond with each of the hydrogens. So each of those hybrid orbitals can bond with a hydrogen. And then now we have one hybrid orbital and one unhybridized orbital. The hybrid orbital, that's gonna do our head-to-head -head overlap for bonding. So that's gonna do our bonds that look similar to that. So since I have this overlap, I know it has to be a sigma bond. So that has to do have a sigma bond to carbon. Now this 2p, this is an unhybridized 2p orbital. What do unhybridized 2p orbitals look like? Well, if I have my carbon, they're going to be a lobe on the top and bottom with a node in the middle. So that's what my p orbital is. If I have two carbons next to each other, both with unhybridized p orbitals, now we can get some overlap on the bottom and some overlap on the top. So now the electron can bounce back and forth on the bottom and the top. This gives us our pi bond. With our pi bond, there's that overlap. You have to have an unhybridized orbital to get a pi bond. So remember, sigma bonds come from the hybridized orbitals usually. Pi bonds are the unhybridized orbital. That's the p orbitals lined up next to each other. So this is our pi bond to our carbon. And so we can see in our structure, the carbons have two bonds to each other. They have what we call a double bond. It's called a double bond because they're sharing four electrons between them, right? Here's one pair of electrons. Here's a second pair of electrons. So we have one sigma bond and one pi bond makes a double bond. So our double bonds So our double bond equals one sigma bond plus one pi bond. And now we can see with our ethylene, there's our hybrid 
orbitals connected to both hydrogens. And then our carbon, the double bond between our two carbons, that's one sigma bond and one pi bond. So that's how we get our double bond. That's where the, that's where the four electrons are coming from. And so one other thing to note about pi bonds is pi bonds have to be oriented parallel to each other. If I have my pi bond and there's overlap like this, as long as the orbitals are overlapping, I get a pi bond. If I rotate 90 degrees, so I take the front carbon and I twist it 90 degrees, now my two orbitals are perpendicular to each other. There's no more overlap, so we don't have a pi bond anymore. So even if you have two unhybridized orbitals next to each other, they have to align right, and they have to align with each other and be parallel to each other in order to make a pi bond. And so nature and chemistry, the two carbons will line up and have the two p orbitals parallel to each other. It actually takes energy to rotate the carbons around and to break them. So if we, we remember, this is how we can end up with our cis-trans configurations, where the p orbitals are locking the two carbons into place here. There's no more rotation because they have, they're have they blocked on the top and the bottom. They're kind of stuck. Looking at our bonds, we have our single bonds. Those are always sigma bonds. Single bonds are always sigma bonds. And that's because the overlap is greater and stronger. It takes more energy to break a single bond than it does to break a double bond. And that's because there's a much stronger overlap and a stronger bond between the two sigma orbitals. In multiple bonds, one of them has to be a sigma bond and then the rest of them are pi bonds. So one has to be a sigma bond and that's usually from our hybridized orbitals. And then our pi bonds are the unhybridized orbital. So when we draw our structures like we drew for H2, since we drew one line, that has to be one sigma bond. For ethylene, we have two lines between the carbons. With those two lines, one is sigma as we saw, the other is an unhybridized P, so that's a pi bond. If we draw nitrogen N2, one of them has to be a sigma bond, and then the other two have to be pi bonds. So this is how we get our triple bond. It's one sigma plus two pi bonds. Looking at the overlap of electron density for our double bonds, for double bonds here, we have our carbons in the center. We have our carbon and our oxygen in the center. The carbon here is sigma bonded to the oxygen. So this is our sigma bond. And then we have our pi bond on the top and the bottom in pink here. So the pi bond is the unhybridized p orbital of the oxygen and carbon overlapping. You can see why it's above and below because right in between the two atoms, that's where the sigma bond goes. So you can see the sigma bond occupies the space in the middle and then the pi bonds on the top and the bottom. And so that's how we end up with a double bond. And if we drew the Lewis structure for this compound, we draw something that looks similar to that. So you can see when we draw these two lines here, this is what the electron density actually looks like. There's basically three areas of electron density and the pi bond locks it in this particular configuration. Now, when we look at our triple bonds, triple bonds have even more electron density going on around it. So in our triple bond, we have our sigma bond here in the middle, a sigma bond in purple, these are from our hybridized sp orbitals. And then we have two unhybridized p orbitals. So what'll happen is p orbitals on the top and bottom here will overlap. And then the ones in the plane here will overlap as well. So in the front and the back. Doing that, we end up with this structure where I have my sigma bond in the middle on the two sides is a pi bond, and on the top and bottom is another pi bond. So you can see why triple bonds are so strong. Look at all that electron density connecting those two atoms together. Look at all that orbital overlap. If we want to add hydrogens to it to make acetylene, I can add a hydrogen on the hybridized orbital here, 
and the hybridized orbital here. So when we're looking at our different hybridizations, valence bond theory allows us to visualize how the two atoms are connected together and how the electron density looks between the two atoms. It lets us connect it together through sigma bonds and pi bonds. Sigma bonds are from the hybridized orbitals typically. Pi bonds are from the unhybridized p orbitals. And we can even figure all of these out looking at larger molecules. So now larger molecules make a little more sense. When we're looking at the geometry, it's easier to look at the geometry of each atom as opposed to the entire molecule. So I can look at the geometry of my first carbon here, my second carbon. I can look at the geometry of the oxygen or even this oxygen. So when we're looking at larger molecules, it's always easier to break it down into smaller pieces, break it down into individual atoms when you're looking at geometry. So if we do that, and I look at acetic acid here, I have a carbon that's bonded to three hydrogens and another carbon. So there's four bonds total, there's four domains. Since there's four domains and they're all bonded, that gives me tetrahedral. My second carbon, it's bonded to three different things. I have, two, I have two single bonds and a double bond. Since I have three electron groups, that gives me trigonal planar for the central carbon. Oxygen here, since it's bonded to two different atoms and it has two lone pairs, that still gives me four electron groups, which gives me an electron domain or electron group geometry of tetrahedral. The oxygen, since it only has two atoms bonded to it and two lone pairs, the molecular geometry for this oxygen would actually be bent. And if we were also to figure out what types of bonds we have, I know all of these have to be sigma bonds because they're single bonds. This has to be a sigma bond, same with this one and that one. And on my carbon oxygen here, I have a sigma bond and a pi bond. So I have to have two different types of bonds there since it's a double bond. So now you should have a better idea about your valence bond theory and how to figure out how many pi bonds or sigma bonds you have in a molecule.